Thank you very much. I didn't know there was gonna be the full bio, so that's great, I appreciate the introduction that way. First of all, I'd just like to say, um, very thankful uh, to be here. And um, also anytime I'm asked to present, I'm, I'm sort of humbled because um, I guess I, I finally learned something that some people are interested in and happy to share that. Uh, but uh, it's always a humbling experience to be invited um, to speak. I'll get into this a little bit more in the presentation, but um, I grew up on a farm. It was a very small farm. We didn't row crop farm. So being in this type of audience with uh, fellow farmers um, is also kind of um, surreal at some, at some point. And then uh, also being in the food industry now is also something that I never thought I would be in the food industry either. Uh, I spent uh, about 19 years in corporate America uh, in the IT industry. So uh, the first thing, uh, especially for this audience, I thought it was important that uh, I put my credential up there. So <laughs> we farm, um, we uh, do some cover cropping, we're just getting started on this journey, and um, I'm very happy that I have an awesome mentor, Mr. Tom Cotter, um, and the connection made through Minnesota Soil Health Coalition uh, Mark has been very helpful uh, to me in connecting with different resources when we need it. So um, I just really enjoy being a part of this uh, community. So we're going to talk about markets, but every time I give a presentation, I give lots of different types of presentations to different audiences, and I find myself always needing to just kind of go back and tell my story because that is related to really everything we're doing now uh, within the company. So as I mentioned, we had a very small farm in Hastings, Minnesota. My dad uh, worked for Coca-Cola, so we boarded horses ever since I could remember. And my neighbors don't think I'm a farmer, even though I partner farm now about 800 acres with a good friend of mine, because they saw me growing up and we had hay and stuff we grew for our horses, but all of our tillable land outside of hay and forage was, was rented out. And I really never thought I'd have an opportunity to farm because, you know, we didn't have enough land. Um, we're in sort of an urban area, uh, Denmark Township, right outside of Hastings, sort of sandwiched between the outskirts of St. Paul, Minneapolis, and uh, the border with Wisconsin. And we farm, most of our land is actually farmed in Wisconsin as, as rented land. Uh, as mentioned, corn, soybeans, um, alfalfa still, sunflowers now. We'll get into that with uh, how it relates to the company and what we're doing. Uh, buckwheat is something uh, we're growing now, looking at growing sorghum on our farm this year. Um, about 100 acres of our total 800 acre farm operation is organic. And that was a journey uh, that was really, the genesis of that was in the food industry. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. So hemp, <laughs> where did that come along? Um, I can't really tell the story without talking about hemp. So when my father passed in 2008, I bought out our farm operation from our estate in 2010. And like a lot of next generation, you're trying to figure out how are you gonna make things work. You're also doing a lot of personal reflecting on what's important to you. And you know your life is kind of starting over when you lose someone really close to you and your family. And so I was going through all that. Um, but the main thing was, you know, I've kind of been a lifelong entre entrepreneur in a bottle of corporate America. And I was like, you know, this is an opportunity to look at our farm and how we can do some things differently. Um, a really good example of that is our group of friends from college kind of were working together and we'd go in on beef cattle. And I think between the group, we consumed about three of them between all of us and we just put our order in and uh, get them a year later. And one of my friends said, well, why don't you have cattle on your farm? And I was like, well, we had cattle one time as a kid in 4-H. We had uh, five steers, and my dad had really great intentions. He was a farm kid from Watertown, South Dakota, and uh, my family, my cousins and stuff still farm out there. 
and uh, I don't know how old they were when we got them, but um, I think it was two days before the county fair, we decided we would te better teach them to lead <laughs> and uh, hooked them to a tractor. And that did not go uh, very well, as you might imagine. So they went to the stockyards the next day, and that was the last time we had cattle uh, up until this point. Uh, but then we brought uh, five head of cattle from a neighbor. Um, I had no mixers. We didn't have corn in stock. So I had him grind it, and I bought a steer stuffer and we started with five head of cattle. And that was kind of every year we sold freezer beef to our friend group. And then we started marketing you know, outside of that to, to others. And now we still sell a lot of freezer beef, probably about 10 head a year. And my friend Ben and I, as part of our farm operation, we run about uh, 20 to 30 head of, of cattle as part of that. Then along came hemp. And in 2016 was the first year Minnesota could grow hemp uh, legally under the pilot program and I didn't know anything about hemp. I thought hemp was a stock of the marijuana plant. That's how uninformed I was and I just said I wanted to be the first to do it because if we were the first to do it uh, there would be some market advantage and we'd be able to figure it out and no one else is doing it. So I always looked at opportunities where um, and it relates to farming as well. If everybody's farming this way there probably are a couple different ways we should look at. And so that's why this whole soil health movement, the regenerative agriculture movement, um, we'll get into what that means too maybe, um, is really exciting uh, for me because it's, it's something kind of innovative. Well, anyway, I said if we're going to do this, we need a, a specific company to focus on hemp. So we created Minnesota Hemp Farms um, in 2016. And then we also created the brand Field Theory. And the reason I did that is because we wanted to take it all the way to supermarket. So the focus was bulk food ingredients. So CBD wasn't really huge at the time. It was just sort of coming. That really happened in the 1718 kind of time frame. 1819 was sort of the boom for that. So this was all grain focus, really taking the Canadian um, hemp company model, growing hemp ourselves, getting it processed, selling bulk ingredient, and then emerging in this CPG, consumer packaged good retail market, which by the way, is a very difficult market. And if I would have known today what I know now, or would known then what I know now, I don't know if I would have done it, but we've started down that path and we're, we're continuing on. And our bulk business now, which has expanded, um, is sort of funding the investment we're making in the retail brand. Uh, but that was the fairly simplistic model. But I was really proud that you know we had a whopping 18 acres of hemp grown that first year. We got it processed. We had a package of hemp hearts, and it was our hemp seed in that bag in that really first you know 12 month period. So it was kind of fun. Uh, doing everything for the first time. Why hemp? Um, Plant-based proteins. This is a quote from 2016. It's still, it's still, you know, it's accurate and it's still on trend. And it was identified back then. You know, you can argue about different types of plant-based protein, how it's being marketed, all those types of things. But at the end of the, the, at the end of the day, the consumer is still exploring this area and interested in it. So it was really timely at, at that point. <clears throat> this slide gets overused a lot, 20,000 uses of hemp. But basically, you've got grain, you've got fiber for industrial materials, uh, insulation, um, animal bedding is probably lowest value use, and then, of course, CBD. So I'm going to kind of just go quickly through this because I like... I like the farming side and talk about farming as much as I can, maybe because I'm a, a new farmer. But um, on the hemp side, it's really three different crops and three different types of farming. And these are pictures from our first um, inaugural year. You know, real simple grain drill seeding. I was excited because I'm very impatient. So uh, four and a half days, you have emergence. It's a lot like um, buckwheat, actually, in that way. Um, based on my observations of growing other crops. Um, and then we try to be a little 
um, scientific, um, some really crude measurements of germination and things like that. There's a few people that probably have seen this portion of the presentation before because we did a lot of road shows, if you will, <laughs> during that first two years because everybody was interested in hemp because they didn't know really anything about it. But it, it was a pretty fascinating crop to watch grow. Very compaction sensitive, so we kind of point that out when we were talking to uh, new growers. This one I, I kind of love because, you know, we're in this corn-centric environment and to see hemp growing, especially back then, you know, it's more common now, but uh, back in 2016, 17, to see hemp growing side by side in a field of corn um, was really cool. And I think, um, I'm excited about where USDA is going, hopefully in the next farm bill, where they're gonna start treating um, at least the grain and fiber side of hemp as any other crop. So not having the arduous licensing processes and things like that that were initially in 2016, uh, but uh, continue on today in some fashion. Hemp's a green crop in, in this scenario, and you can harvest it with a uh, combine. I don't get too excited when I <clears throat> run into a um, little ragweed or a little lamb's quarter now in our organic fields um, or even our conventional fields. Uh, my farmer partner kind of freaks out about weeds, and I say, just remember, we used to combine this stuff all the time. So it's uh, everything else is kind of easy. Um, hemp is... Uh, generally harvested a little bit higher moisture for grain. It kind of works opposite. Um, if you com combine for grain at higher moisture, it has a lot less wrapping issues with the fibrous portions of the stalk, um, but it creates more problems with dry down. So you have to have a lot of aeration and screening uh, right after combining. It's not something you go get a couple semis out and go fill them. It's more filling a tandem go picking your you know, 10, 15 acres, and then going back at it the next day after you, your drying system is catching up. So I don't spend a lot more time on this. You can kind of ignore market values. Those aren't really uh, relevant you know, at this moment, um, but there are some historical values. And there's a lot of unknown challenges. Um, anybody that's grown hemp learns a lot. Um, this was a situation where, uh, for whatever reason, um, the first year we used an international 1480 combine, worked flawlessly. Second year, used a different 1480 combine, had all sorts of problems. And uh, just wrapping issues and shooting smoke and fireballs out the backside, it was kind of kind of interesting. And then we've explored all sorts of uh, ways and methods of growing. The fiber market is really emerging now for hemp, which is kind of exciting. Um, hempcrete, um, different... Um, insulation values and things like that are in the fiber market as long, along with textiles. And so we explored this uh, pretty early on. We were set up as a haying operation, so this was really easy for us to do. Um, uh, here we had two processes, really. We um, cut down uh, hemp at early maturity and did some wet baling, like a, a baleage process. And then we also did um, field dried and baled dry bales too. We sold our hemp fiber that first year to a startup processor who was no longer in business, but really there wasn't any other market at the time. So it was very limited. We didn't do it really for that side of it so much. We were focused on the grain, but like other small grains, you combine for the grain and you get the extra value out of the straw. This is very similar with fiber. Now there are companies that are contracting specifically for fiber, so those are some new markets. And then uh, growing <clears throat> for CBD or medicinal purposes, uh, we got another awesome hemp grower in the, in the crowd, Mr. Cotter. And uh, you know that's a different process as well. So <clears throat> um, there's different ways to grow for CBD, but it's a different variety um, that's higher in C CBD content and not typically grown for grain. It used to be a lot of work. There's more um, improvements and mechanisms that are mechanical benefits that have come along um, to process hemp. But this was kind of my joke because uh, you have to have good labor if you're gonna, gonna grow for CBD. And uh, 
we'll leave the politics um, out of it, but it's always fun when the governor, whoever the governor is, wants to come out to your farm. So it's just really unique experience being able to share something new with different people and creating interests at different levels. So then kind of what happened after hemp, um, we got involved, you know, we were selling successfully uh, bulk ingredients in the hemp grain and food space. So these are dehulled hemp seeds, crushed hemp grain for hemp seed oil, which creates a press cake, which can be milled for protein powder. And at our booth, you can see some examples of these products and uh, there's some other uh, samples from some brands that we work with and happy to, to give some free samples of those products. But really this turned into um, relationships. So we'll get into this with the, the Regen Ag supply chain connections. But uh, we've developed these relationships with some of these food manufacturing companies for the hemp business. And then they came to us and they said, hey, you know, you farm too, you know, outside of hemp, can you grow sunflowers? Never grown sunflowers before, but I said, yeah, we can do that. And so that was sort of the transition from hemp in the Minnesota Hemp Farms brand to other ingredients in the Field Theory bulk ingredient brand outside of retail. So uh, now we go to market as Field Theory Foods as sort of a comprehensive foods company with food ingredient, bulk food ingredient, and retail consumer packaged goods. Um, and this is just a little bit of the way we sort of present that story uh, to brands where we're a unique supplier. So it's their vision, it's their brand, it's their mission, and we want to align our goals with their goals. And that is really where the regenerative agriculture, soil health convergence has happened for us building on those existing relationships. So if you go to our website now, you sort of see these two tracks, hemp products, which are still sold under Minnesota Hemp Farms, and then other specialty products. That would be sunflower, buckwheat, sorghum. We're trying to develop a Kernza market. Uh, some of you maybe have tried Kernza um, as a perennial crop. There's some things that we're doing with our local city uh, to do a hay and Kernza uh, implementation from our farming perspective. And we'd like to develop different flower markets and so forth for Kernza as a perennial grain and that relates into overall different tools in the, in the toolbox, so to speak, for soil health. This is just our list of products, but one other thing that happened along the way of product development is when we were selling bulk hemp products, I was always trying to tell uh, and explain to food companies, why should they look at hemp? Well, it's a plant-based protein. It's high, high in omega-3, 6, and 9, um, and has all these oilseed benefits to it, but we were still selling just an ingredient. We didn't really have a showcase. And I said, you know, we need to eat our own dog food, so to speak. So what other products on the market can we put out there and put hemp in as if we were selling that to ourselves, selling that to our own brand. And I said, well, I'm not a great cook, but I can make breakfast. So I like cooking pancakes. And uh, every once in a while I'll bake, but my daughters, um, I've got a 13 year old and a 12 year old daughter, and uh, they like to do some baking. So we came out with a pancake and a muffin mix and we put hemp protein in it. It's whole grain. We milled, uh, we sourced the wheat and milled all the wheat our, ourselves with a co-manufacturer, but we did the sourcing. And then we added our hemp protein. And then the other thing that was happening at the time was this upcycled food movement was happening. And no one really kind of knew what it was, but I had a good connection local in the Twin Cities with a company called Net Zero. And Net Zero uh, has a proprietary solution to upcycle spent brewer's grain. They also work with eggshells to pull calcium and make that food grade safe for different uses. And they really are selling a, a technology platform. But we were able to invest in that company and we purchase spent brewer's grain from net zero and then we mill that and we add it to our pancake and muffin mix. 
So this provides you know, a unique product that's, there's no product out there for pancakes, I can tell you right now, that has hemp and spent brewer's grain in it. So um, that was what I thought was a good demonstration case for not only hemp, but for this new upcycled food movement. And then the chocolate muffin mix was our next product to launch, and that was the same concept, where we were putting hemp in there, spent brewer's grain, and hopefully making a really great tasting product. And then, of course, we have some hemp extract products. Our hemp extract products today are actually manufactured with a partner that we established back in 2017 on Colorado. They're not anywhere close to as good as Mr. Cotter's products. So this is just uh, kind of some of the highlights of our two more innovative food products. So then we kind of shift into this bulk ingredient space. And we're talking about an intimate network of growers. So these are people that may have started with us with hemp. Uh, sunflower was our next um, sort of big crop production um, aspect. And you know it's a relationship. Um, it's something that growers might not grow those crops for us every single year, but they will come back, you know, based on their crop rotations. And then we're looking at more crops to offer uh, so that we can have growers part of that system and that network every year. Some differences about um, the ingredients that we sell, most of those are identity preserved. So they're specific grower lots, they're segregated all the way through cleaning. Um, growers are paid on a net clean basis for what their actual clean out was, not some grading scale. Uh, when they deliver product. And um, that's in becoming more and more important to the brands because they want some transparency into where their ingredients are coming from. And they now, um, especially with the regenerative ag movement, they want uh, to understand better how it was grown. So we still have hemp seed products in bulk, but then this is a kind of a short list of seeds, grains, oils, and, and flowers in different areas that, uh, that we work with today. When we talk uh, to new folks about field theory, we talk about being a U.S.-based company. You know, that's important to them. Upcycled foods, that was a movement identified by Whole Foods in 2021. Um, interestingly, buckwheat is a Whole Foods trend for 2024. Um, so our supply chain in buckwheat is pretty advanced right now, and we think that that's going to create a lot more brand interest uh, based on Whole Foods kind of leading those initiatives. Regenerative agriculture, simple clean ingredients. So what we put in our retail products um, should be simple, not a lot of additives, natural this or natural that, which most times are actually not made in a natural manner. So Regen Ag, what is it and how do we engage brands? The first part is probably equally hard as the second. So what I love about regenerative ag, that term, is that it's not explicitly defined. There's no litmus test that says you're regenerative farming and you're not. It's these principles of soil health. And this is an area that I didn't really know anything about five years ago. One of our brands, again with the Sunflower Initiative, said, hey, you know, what about this? What about that? And I was like, what's regenerative ag? You know, enter the Google search. And it wasn't a tremendous amount of information compared to today about that term. And it's still loosely defined, but it's soil health improvement tenants right? Living cover in the soil, reducing tillage, crop rotations, uh, variability um, in what's being grown, uh, reducing monocropping. The second part is how to engage brands. So the organic folks, um, how many people here organic farm? So a few, not everybody. Um, and that's good that we have a mix. Whenever I talk to farmers, I say, hey, why don't you put at least 10% of your production in organic? Well, I, I can't farm all my land. I said, no, you didn't hear what I said. 
diversity is good. You can experiment with organic without having to transition your whole farm. You can figure it out, establish a mentor relationship, get some help, and, and also take advantage of most of the time a premium in the market. So then we start doing some math and they kind of get excited about it. We got into organic, um, I'm not ashamed to admit, 100% from the for the commercial side. When we transitioned, the first year we had, we were, we were able to transition some of our hay ground first year because we didn't have any inputs put on it. Um, and we grew organic corn and I think we, we had a neighbor clean that for us and we sold it for food grade. And I think we sold that for 16 or $17 a bushel delivered corn. And conventional corn at the time was 380, something like that. I mean, that was just unfathomable, really, the difference. And it was a little bit more work. Got lucky with the direct connection to someone who was seeking that accepted the quality as food grade. So there's organic feed grade, there's organic food grade. This is just a huge premium to capture. And I said, hey, how are we, you know, what are we gonna grow next? Who's the next buyer of uh, whatever crop that we can grow organically? Um, we farm 800 acres. My farmer partner is not necessarily bought into the organic mindset. It's coming along a little bit on soil health, but generally likes it black. So we have this, uh, Interesting dynamic when we farm together. But um, the point is, is that there's a premium out there to explore, you know, if you're interested in doing it. But the organic folks generally are pretty good about seeking their, their market. So they're sort of wired this way because they do everything kind of different from the get-go and, and there's less elevators and huge buyers and some of the buyers that were huge went bankrupt, stiffed a lot of farmers. I was one of those farmers. So um, establishing that direct sale, that direct connection, selling beef direct to the consumer, all these things are really good things. They give you diversity, they reduce your risk, um, but they're not necessarily easy. And so some of the growers, that we've worked with year one uh, or something, and they're like, they wanna go establish their own relationship directly. And then they kinda come back and they say, yeah, I didn't know anything about food safety. I didn't know anything about all the testing I needed to do. I thought that my local uh, seed cleaner could clean everything out and then I found out that they had gluten contamination and you know, let's make it up. They wanted to buy oats. Raise oats on the farm, clean oats. Oats is gluten-free, but the cleaning facility just got done cleaning wheat. So they contaminated all the oats with gluten. And there goes the market. So there's all these things that are difficult uh, to work with brands. The other side of it is um, the brands thought working with farmers is really easy. And farmers are a unique bunch of folks. Everybody is different. Everyone's got a different personality. Some people are really accommodating, some aren't. Um, so brands that work directly with farmers, they're spending more time and resources in their company to work with those individual one-to-one -one relationships versus working with a company who's in the background working with those farmers. So that's really where field theory has found an opportunity to compete as a really small company. We're self-funded, my bank account, and being able to give the brands what they're seeking with transparency and um, access to farmers who are growing their crop and growing their crop in a certain way, but being able to work with one entity and we're kind of helping with the sausage making in the background and, and dialoguing with growers and working through all the logistics challenges and things like that. So there's two ways to go about it. I'm not discouraging anybody from seeking higher value opportunities, 
but there is sort of an evolution in this, I'll call it light commoditization of these specialty crops where you can work with a company like ours and some other companies to do that and there's trade-offs with that. Partnerships with brands. I mentioned sunflowers. So sunflower came from Simple Mills. Um, really good now friend that used to work at Simple Mills. You know, she was the one that was challenging me about regenerative ag. And then she came to me in, I think it was February. And she said, hey, do you think you can grow sunflowers? And I said, yeah, how hard can it be? <laughs> because I'm, I'm dumb and I just say yes to stuff. But um, and I said, no, I said, we, we could do it. I said, we have to figure it out. I said, I haven't done it. Oh yeah, it's organic and we need 300 acres. And I said, well, what variety? No idea. Well, just the seed, clean seed, no kernel. So I said, I can do this for you, but we need some commitment. And I said, is Simple Mills talking about regenerative or are they actually meaningful with their pocketbook? And they said, no, we, we mean what we say and we're willing to support it. What do you need? I said, if you need 300 acres of sunflower committed in the next two weeks, and by this time the conversation drifted into March, you have to give the grower a guaranteed per acre they have total crop failure or not. And I said, and I'll get your commitment. And they did, $1,000 an acre, guaranteed. Guys that got awesome yield, they are kinda like, oh, I don't know if that was such a good deal. I could've got a few more bucks maybe if we would've went by the pound. But if they would've got completely wiped out, they would've still got their $1,000 an acre. That's a pretty significant commitment. And that was the start of this. So now we're in, I think it's year five of the Sunflower program with them. Just a phenomenal relationship. And um, you know, it's really, really great. It's been great for their company. It's been great for us to start down this journey of more diversified food ingredients. And it's been really great for a lot of farmers. So one of the things that they do through this program, so we're, we're the ones that are contracting with the growers. Got, one other one in this room anyway. And um, they provide the planting seed. So we went through the work of figuring out the variety that they needed. There was some headache in that, testing levels, uh, what was required. And now we grow the same variety for them every year and they provide the planting seed. There's also a $50 per acre regenerative ag bonus. So what does that mean? That means if you're cover cropping, if you're making planter modifications, if you're buying fencing to introduce livestock, you can submit your receipts up to that $50 an acre and they're covering that. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to incent this regenerative practice um, being less risk and more advantageous to the farmers so that they can experiment with this and if they have a failure, it, it wasn't financially as impactful. So it was a really cool thing. And I'm gonna to try to play this video because it's on their website. And this is with their CEO. I'm hoping it's gonna work. Caitlin, welcome to the Simple Mills Sunflower Field growing just for you. It is incredible. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's like simple mills in a field. I, a few years ago, started investigating the impacts that our food system have on our environment, and it was something that really bothered me. One of the things that I feel is just a great sense of responsibility as a food company. The food that we source and where we source it from and how it's grown really matters. I think that we can really help lead the way and set a positive example of how other companies can do it as well. I think it's especially rare when you have a, a company of that size coming out to the farm and taking time to actually come and see, you know, what it is you're dealing with, the challenges that you face, and to ultimately come and see your success, which is the most fun to share. 
We need partners like this to help us deliver food that not only tastes great and nourishes bodies, but has a positive impact on the soil and on these communities and really want to help us leave the world in a better place than we found it. The relationship with Simple Mills is really um, amazing. Through the direct trade program, we also have incentives to implement some of these practices that we have shared commitment in with the regenerative side. So uh, cover cropping incentives, and also the ability to try new crops that we otherwise might not due to the risk side. What makes you so passionate about these regenerative techniques? If you kind of think about getting back to nature and having more uh, diversity and less uh, monocropping, those things to me just have always made sense. What we're seeing though is the more things that we grow, uh, it seems to be helpful to the soil. So you bring the cattle on here after the sunflowers come off. What benefit does that have? Uh, what it does is it speeds up the nutrient cycle. So they'll actually digest all of this forage and that'll turn this into nutrients that the soil can utilize right away again next year. To be honest, it's, it's sort of a dream come true to have partners like John and like Luke who are helping us think about different ways of growing food and thinking about how we can have a positive impact on our planet with the way that we grow our food. And I just feel a lot of respect for what they're doing. You're actually making meaningful impact on the farm and the practices of regenerative ag and carbon sequestration. I mean, we're able to do that now because of some of these benefits of working with your brand. Before I started farming organically, I really didn't know where my crop ended up. Having somebody like you actually come out to the farm who's actually purchasing the crop for me, it builds a, you know, a relationship. I confidently can go into the next year and I can build on what I've already done, but I can keep working towards a better system. You know, coming out here is really good for my soul and, and for our team to see our partners and how they're impacting our food and how they're growing our food and the challenges they face. It's really rewarding. This will be the first of many trips out here. I can't wait to come back and see an even larger field next time. So um, that was Simple Mills video. It's on their website. Um, we have a John and a Luke we're seek and a Tom. We're seeking a Mark <laughs> to complete our, <laughs> our Bible growers of sunflowers. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a really, that's probably one of the, my most uh, treasured brand relationships, at, at least at this point, because they were so instrumental in shaping really what we're doing right now. And it's just, you know, I feel like I've been on this journey and, you know, everybody's got this different story about why they, where they are and, and where they've come from. But really that my father's passing set things in motion and it's just kind of one thing after another has in, in a lot of ways fallen into place. It's been a lot of hard work, obviously a lot of planning and things too, but uh, things are just sort of happening. Another great brand, um, some of you got the opportunity to meet Brady from Seven Sundays. Um, so they're another local brand in Minnesota. They are now in a whole bunch of Costco's. They are using the byproduct of the sunflower crushing. So Simple Mills uses kernel and we manufacture that for them. Um, another company is crushing oil and selling the byproduct um, of the press cake, uh, and then we're milling that, selling that to um, Seven Sundays, and they're making a cereal product with it. So it's an upcycled product as well. Really innovative, unique, um, and then they're doing a lot with oats. They're using a, another upcycled ingredient from Sonata uh, for their high protein oats. So really cool brand. He was here, he's excited, he loves everything about regen, soil health. I think if he could do anything, he would become a farmer. So Brady's a really cool person. And then the other super exciting thing we've got going on is buckwheat. I didn't know anything about buckwheat. A couple years ago, we grew it on our farm for the first time. It's one of my favorite crops to grow right now. And we found this brand called Pacha, and all they make is buckwheat bread. Different flavors of buckwheat bread. They're also making a bun. And they were seeking authenticity in regenerative. And the primary buckwheat supplier that they were working with 
said, uh, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, well, you know, we, we want to know, like, how it's grown and that they're doing soil health practices and all this because, you know, this is a mission of our brand. And buckwheat's this great crop for cover cropping, but, you know, general soil health, crop rotations, all this sort of good stuff. And they're like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. And that is exactly what the old food system mindset is. The new food system mindset says, what do you want to know? How can I help you? How can I get you the transparency? Because there's a lot of stuff that a lot of the big companies, they don't want those food companies to see where their food came from. Is it imported and actually sold as U.S. grown? Um, all those sorts of things. And along came Soil Carbon Initiative. So I'll, I've got the next slide um, is on that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But just this year, um, I had never sold any buckwheat before in my life 12 months ago, and we contracted 1,000 acres of buckwheat production specifically for this brand this year. And the requirement was they had to be regenerative ag uh, verified. Regen ag verified, well, what the heck is that? Um, some of you are familiar with some of these organizations, some of you are not. Um, regenerative Organic Certified um, ROA, they are setting the bar, if you will, on the regenerative verification. I looked into this for our own farm, organic. Um, it's a lot of verification of livestock, verification of fair wages, um, and a lot of uh, social social dynamic, you know, and personally, I was a little put off by it because the implication was immediately that I wasn't doing those things, that I was doing something bad, and I had to prove that we were a good farmer, we were a good person, good human being, and I feel like the folks that created that standard had such a disconnect from what I know as a farmer myself, and 90 some percent of the farmers I've met. And it's a, it's a standard that is immediately established and you have to meet it. That's what I know about Regenerative Organic Certified. It may have changed a little bit, I might be misrepresenting, you make up your own mind if you're an organic farmer and you're interested in that. The goal is, outside of soil health improvement, which we all have a shared interest in, is a premium for the farmer. And some of those farmers that I've talked to, in particular on oats, they said, I think I'm gonna drop my certification because I don't think I can get a premium. I don't know how to connect with it. But they do have a list of organic growers and brands can actually go find them, so that's good. Uh, Regenerified is another one. Unfortunately, I just don't know much about them, but I wanted to list them because um, they've been in the news a lot and you know they're established. Soil Carbon Initiative is the one uh, that I'm closest with and uh, really partnered with at this point. And what I love about Soil Carbon Initiative, number one, it's open to conventional and organic growers. And that was something that I thought was really important because we can have a good, good debate about do organic growers have good soil health practices because they do a lot of tillage? Tom talked yesterday awesomely about negatives and positives. So there's some negatives maybe with a little bit more tillage, some positives with huge crop rotations, um, cover cropping is sort of ingrained in the organic system. So there's this balance back and forth. But can't you be regenerative and be a conventional farmer? I think you can. Some people say absolutely not. Some of the people in the food companies and the brands think you absolutely can't because any chemical is terrible and they don't understand the whole GMO thing. That's a different debate. But I love Soil Carbon Initiative because Soil Carbon Initiative says, yeah. The other thing is farmers help create the standard of Soil Carbon Initiative. And it's a framework. And the best thing about it is you can have moldboard plowing, only grow two crops, and you can be in soil carbon initiative that year. You sign your farms up, 
you put a plan together for how you're going to make soil health improvement, and they say, welcome to the journey. And then they measure you as you go. There's no big bar that you gotta work for a couple years or like organic transition to get to a certain point before you can be legitimized as regenerative organic. They say, let's get you into the party. Let's start the journey. Let's get in the car. Let's start going down the road. And I love that because, you know, many of you talk about this in the farming community. Organic is 1% of our, of our farm production. Why are we trying to make that 1% that's perceivably better even better? Why don't we focus on 99% and make it a lot better? And that might be the pathway to organic. You don't have to, but a lot of those principles are gonna apply in the organic production or be required in the production system. So that's why I love Soil Carbon Initiative. Information, analytics, they can help you with some farm profitability stuff. Um, the first step really is enroll, decide how many acres of your farm. You don't have to do your whole farm. I don't know why you wouldn't do your whole farm, but it's up to you. They'll do uh, soil testing. So this year, um, Russell was here talking about Regen Labs as part of the SCI program for the first year cohort pilot. There's about 100,000 acres that signed up now in SCI. Um, it was all free soil testing, and I had Russell on the phone this spring uh, with Liz on the phone going through our soil samples, and he's like, hey, man, that looks like you could cut that, cut the urea a little bit, add boron. Those are all benefits that were first step hitched to SCI. And, and so now it's signing those farms up, implementing those practices, and then monitoring what happens on those farms. And they're also realistic about it because nothing ever goes perfectly. It takes a little bit. So just because you're starting cover cropping or starting no-till, you might have some things showing up in your soil test that actually look worse the next year. Why is that? We can dig into it and find it out. But basically, with uh, I'm sounding like this is an infomercial for SEI. It's not really meant to be. It's just meant to be um, something that I know a lot more detail about, and I think they're on the right track, and I want to support them. And in our contract this year for buckwheat, we required SCI enrollment because the brand required that. The brand wanted to know and feel confident that the organic buckwheat that we were sourcing for them came from farms that were implementing these practices. And so this is the first ingredient, the bulk ingredient, that will be regenerative uh, verified through the SCI program. And what that means to the brand is they can actually, if 75% or more of their total ingredient that they sell on the shelf is made up of a regenerative ingredient, they can carry the seal on their, their package. And they just got into Whole Foods. It's probably a 10x multiplier of their volume. What's that mean? It means a lot more regen verified buckwheat next year. And this is what drives it. This is what sales solves all problems. We need the brands to go out there and sell. We need to give them the tools that they think they need to connect with the consumers to carry that volume. And then in the back end, we have to build the supply chain and retool it because the supply chain is not really built for this stuff. If you go to a big aggregator and you say, I want to identity preserve a thousand acres of buckwheat or oats or wheat, they'll be like, absolutely, we can't do that. We, we're set up to run 5,000, 10,000 acres of product in different lots, right? Everything's blended. So <clears throat> this is sort of the new era. Um, it's emerging. To me, it's very exciting. Um, here's a contact. Um, I can connect you directly with uh, Taylor, um, if you're interested. She's an awesome person, great um, organization to be a part of, um, and just super helpful.